going to say. And even if I get in trouble, you know what I'm saying? That Ain't that what we're supposed to do? It's, I'm not saying I'm going to rule the world or I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the, the, the brain that will change the world. And that's our job. You know what's funny when it rains and pours? They got money for wars, but can't be the poor. There's no way that these people should own planes and their people don't have houses, apartments, shacks, drawers, pants. It's too much money here. I mean, nobody should be hitting Lotto for 36 million and we got people starving in the streets. That is not idealistic, that's just real. That is just stupid. Tupac Shakur, one of the most iconic and influential rap artists of all time. Tupac is known for making classic albums, chart-topping hits, and is often credited for normalizing vulnerability in hip hop and popularizing so-called conscious rap. But did you know that Tupac was a communist? Yes, communist with a capital C. And did you know that the FBI had an entire file on him and were deeply suspicious of his radical activities? It is already well known that Tupac was more overtly political compared to most hip-hop artists. However, the depth of Tupac's politics is widely misunderstood. The typical mainstream portrayal of Tupac Shakur depicts him as just some gangster rapper dude who is always in trouble, and they totally neglect his revolutionary side and his radical family history. Despite growing up in poverty and having an extremely rough childhood, Tupac went to art school when he was younger and was considered to be extremely intellectually gifted at a young age. I think adults should go through school again. You know, I think that I think that rich people should live like poor people and poor people should live like rich people and it should change every week. It was only later when Tupac became a rapper that he strategically put on a more gangster persona so that he could appeal to people in the hood and radicalize the streets. This was part of his project known as Thug Life. But the idea of thug life is deeply misunderstood and has become completely detached from its original meaning, which basically involves unifying rival LA gangs to contain violence and restore order to black communities. Popular media typically portrayed it as a depthless anti-establishmentism that glorifies crime and thuggery. But for Tupac, thug life was a lot more than just some edgy slogan about being a thug. Murdered at just the age of 25, Tupac's death is a highly controversial topic still subject to investigation and conspiracies to this very day. While it has been discovered who killed Tupac, the details surrounding his death and who planned his death are very murky. Some have claimed that the FBI was actually involved in Tupac's first assassination attempt in 1994 and his murder in 1996. The FBI did have their eyes on Tupac, and the FBI file on him is now publicly available. Well, partially. Part of it's blacked out. Though it is important to acknowledge that the extent to which the FBI was indirectly involved in Tupac's assassination and his first assassination attempt is still very uncertain, so I will refrain from making any unproven claims. But why? Why would the FBI be so concerned with a rapper? In this One Dime video, we will explore why this was the case. Why Tupac was a lot more than just an iconic rapper. Now, unlike Tupac, most of us don't gotta worry about the government spying and collecting data on us. But who needs government surveillance anymore when private companies fish your data all the time and data brokers sell your personal information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who might want to target you? Your government name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's probably all out there. But I don't gotta worry about that anymore ever since I started using Aura which I am genuinely happy to say is the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could potentially use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. And the best part is I don't even gotta worry or pay attention to this because Aura just pretty much protects me in the background from threats that I don't even see. And you also get a bunch of other cool features like an antivirus, a VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download a billion different apps. It's a super convenient all-in-one service at a relatively affordable price. I used to think I was all safe by just having an antivirus, but not having Aura these days is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. I value my privacy, and if you value yours, you can sign up using my link in the description, aura.com slash one dime, where you can get a two-week free trial. Now back to the video. Tupac Amaru Shakur was named after Tupac Amaru, an Incan Peruvian revolutionary rebel who led an indigenous uprising against Spain and was subsequently executed. So my mom named me after this Inca chief, and I think the tribal breakdown means like intelligent warrior, something like that. But I see. He's a deep dude. Throughout his youth, Tupac read a lot, and was considered to be an intellectual protege already in high school. When attending art school, he also worked as a backup dancer, 
did ballet, read literature, and was quite far from what one would call a gangster. You know, theater, ballet, listen to different types of music, songs that became the soundtrack to my life. Still, being an artsy fartsy type wouldn't stop Tupac from eventually shooting two cops to defend an innocent black victim against police brutality. And it sure didn't stop him from eventually trying to unify rival gangs and getting placed high on the FBI's watch list. When he was younger, Tupac was a member of the Baltimore Young Communist League, and at one point, he even dated the daughter of the director of the local chapter of the Communist Party USA. The Maryland chapter of the Communist Youth League, where he spent his high school years, eventually got named after him. Tupac was radicalized at a very young age, spending much of his childhood on the run from the FBI due to the radical activities of the Shakur family. Now let me tell you about the Shakurs. Yeah. Much of Tupac's family were affiliated with communist groups, like the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. Tupac's mother, Fanny Shakur, and his father, Billy Garland, were members of the Black Panther Party in New York in the late 1960s and early 1970s. A Fanny Shakur, Tupac's mom, who uh, was my mentor in the Black Panther Party, my big sister, was brilliant organizing, organizer around housing. In 1969, Fanny Shakur and 20 other Black Panthers were arrested and accused of conspiring to bomb police stations, leading to the famous Panther 21 trial, which became a crucial event in the struggle for black liberation. Tupac was born just a month after his mother, Afeni, was acquitted of more than 150 charges of conspiracy against the U.S. government. Fast forward to when Tupac was just a little kid, the FBI were tracking his stepfather, Matulu Shakur, who had ties to the Black Liberation Army, and was on the top 10 most wanted list for anti-government activities. Tupac's godfather was Geronimo Pratt, who was also a prominent Black Panther that was targeted by the FBI's highly authoritarian secretive COINTELPRO mission, which was the program behind the assassination of black leaders like Fred Hampton. Many of us know about COINTELPRO now, but back at this time it was a highly secretive mission. Probably the most famous Shakur after Tupac himself was Asada Shakur, Tupac's godmother. She has an absolutely fascinating autobiography that was one of my favorite books that I read a couple years ago. Asada Shakur was at one point affiliated with the Black Panthers, and most importantly, was part of the Black Liberation Army. Throughout her life, Asada Shakur was accused of many crimes. She was falsely accused of bank robbery and was later acquitted. But most famously, she was later accused of shooting and killing a cop who tried to arrest her. And despite very little evidence that she was even holding a gun at the time of the incident, Asada was put in a jail cell with very inhumane conditions. Joanne Chesimad, what we know as Asada Shakur. The allegation that she was a cold-blooded killer is not supported by any of the forensic evidence. But with the help of Tupac's stepdad, Asada Shakur ended up escaping from prison and fled to Cuba, where the government gave her asylum. She still lives there to this very day. Asada Shakur was put on a most wanted list and even President George W. Bush himself put a $1 million bounty on her head during the start of the first war on terror in 2003. So as you can see, Tupac came from a quite radical family tree of committed revolutionaries. In addition to his radical heritage, Tupac was heavily influenced by the writings and speeches of black Marxist revolutionaries, such as Huey Newton, leader of the Black Panther Party and an excellent theoretician. The Huey Newton Reader was actually one of my favorite books in the past few years. At one point in time, J. Edgar Hoover, a leader of the FBI, labeled the Black Panther Party as the most dangerous threat to American security. And by this, he meant the most dangerous revolutionary communist vanguard. But the Black Panther Party eventually collapsed, due to many complicated reasons. Feeling disillusioned by the failure of the Black Power Movement and enraged by the ongoing racial oppression following the mass incarceration policies of Reagan, Bush, and later Clinton, young Tupac considered following in the footsteps of his parents to become a revolutionary. We asked 10 years ago, we was asking with the Panthers, we was asking with them, you know, the civil rights movement, we was asking, you know, now that those people that were asking, they're all dead and in jail. So now what do you think we're gonna do? But his unique artistic talents made him want to pursue this ambition in a different way. Tupac always had a strong sense of justice and wanted to change the world, but he saw that black communities and black culture were becoming increasingly depoliticized in the 80s and 90s. I'm not getting on Hanuman, and I'm not gonna say, he did sell 10 million records, but uh, crack fiends bought 10 million rocks, that don't mean crack is good. <laughs> that don't mean nothing. Sell a record don't mean nothing. The reason, I mean, I, I'm down with him because he's a brother and he's making his mail. But, however, he's diluting rap, you know what I'm saying? He's making something, he's playing that Sambo role, and the reason everybody's buying his record is because he's no threat, and everybody want to see Sambo dance. While simultaneously pursuing music, Tupac became the youngest national chairman of the New African Panthers at just the age of 16. 
He was en route to become the next leader of the movement. This would capture the attention of the FBI, and as we will see, the FBI would eventually write up a quite lengthy file on Tupac. Although kept secret at the time, Tupac's FBI file is now available to the public, but only 104 pages of it, out of 4,000. The remaining 3,896 pages are censored for national security reasons. Tupac and those who were more influenced by the communist side of the Black Power movement also didn't like the Nation of Islam because they felt that they were a kind of psyop that promoted a kind of pseudo-politics that was antithetical to the vision of the Black Panthers and their successors. Tupac's issue with the Nation of Islam would be an ongoing thing throughout his rap career. Their members would follow him everywhere, trying to make it look like he was associated with them, to get his approval because he was a Shakur. Tupac hated the Nation of Islam because he believed they were behind the assassination of Malcolm X, who he greatly admired, and in hindsight, these suspicions were on point. Since then, a lot of evidence does point to the Nation of Islam being behind Malcolm X's assassination. See, Tupac was a strong supporter of black liberation, but not the kind of black nationalists who rejected collaborating with white working class people. Like the young Fred Hampton, Tupac was skeptical of a kind of politics that just amounted to a black capitalism. In fact, one of Tupac's earliest disputes with Biggie Smalls was that he felt that he was seduced by money and the corporate ideology of the music industry. And I feel as though he wronged me. You got out of hand and you wronged me. You got seduced by the power, not because it's an evil person, yeah. but because money is evil if it's not handled right. The YouTuber FT Signifier has a great video on the topic of black capitalism called The Faces of Black Conservatism. See, unlike the corporate black capitalist ideology espoused by the likes of P. Diddy and Jay-Z, Tupac was more influenced by the communists. It's like this. The masses, the hungry people, they outweigh the rich. So as long as I appeal to the hungry and the poverty-stricken people, it's all good. I'm going to have a job for life. While it's cool to like the Black Panthers today, people often forget that the Black Panthers espoused the ideology of Marxism-Leninism and were also influenced by the thought of Mao Zedong. Marxism-Leninism itself has taken on very different forms and manifested quite differently in the USSR, Yugoslavia, Cuba, Vietnam, and China. We all know Marxism is a communist ideology, but what is communism actually? What does it mean to be a communist? While this might be obvious to some of you, it is not for the majority of the population, especially in America. Most Americans and Westerners in general are taught to believe that socialism is when the government does stuff. And it's more socialism, the more stuff it does. And if it does a real lot of stuff, it's communism. In reality, the term communism generally refers to a stateless class of society. Socialism, on the other hand, is where things get a lot more debatable. Socialism is generally thought of as a mode of social organization which advocates that the means of production, basically the capital, the land, machinery used to produce wealth, should be owned by the workers who do the actual work or the community as a whole. For Marxist communists, socialism is generally thought of as the transitionary stage whereby society moves away from capitalism and gradually towards communism, whereby the workers take ownership over the means of production and the state, and class distinctions are gradually overcome. Now we don't have time in this video for a whole lesson on communist theory, but for further learning, here are some good introductory videos on what socialism and communism actually are. We, we might not be the ones, but let's not be selfish, and because we're not going to change the world, let's not talk about how we should change it. I don't know how to change it, but I know if I keep talking about how dirty it is out here, somebody's going to clean it up. Now although Tupac Shakur was affiliated with all these communist figures and organizations, he never publicly declared himself to be a communist. And this makes sense. Tupac was a radical in a time without radical politics. Tupac was an adult during the 90s, and this was one of the most difficult times to be a socialist or communist. The fall of the USSR and actually existing socialism ushered in what the political theorist Francis Fukuyama famously declared as the end of history. Not only was communism dead, but even words like capitalism were now taboo, and seemed old-fashioned. People thought they were entering a post-ideological age. And of course, when ideology is most invisible, it is the most powerful. Still, in America, there were big events like the LA riots in response to the beating of Rodney King and the subsequent police acquittal, which galvanized discourse surrounding racial justice. These events were transgressive and confrontational, but they were disconnected from any broader political alternative to the status quo. And it's easy for the corporate political establishment to co-op social movements when they lack a concrete politics in the first place. Tupac's evolution from his first two albums, which were much more overtly political, to his later albums that he put out under Death Row, happened under this socio-political context. Nevertheless, Tupac's life remained one of rebellion. 
Even as he got more commercially successful, Tupac would quietly be plotting much larger ambitions to facilitate projects and organizations that could definitely be described as political. Picture perfect, I paint a picture, bomb the hoochies with precision. Ain't nothing but a gangster party. Tupac's words were meant to speak life to those in struggle. And in a lot of this music, it's only talking, it's only talking about the suppressed rising, I mean the oppressed rising up against the oppressor. That's all, that's what my music's about. And he lived those words. Tupac had already stirred up political controversy with his early album Tupacalypse Now. And in 1992, Tupac was even denounced at the Republican National Convention by Vice President Dan Quayle. Quayle called for the music industry to blackball his music. There is absolutely no reason for a record like this to be published uh, by a responsible corporation. There are even rumors that Dan Quayle was able to get the music industry to prevent Tupac from putting out an album called Troublesome. But the real reason Republicans were freaking out about Tupac was because of his shootout with two off-duty cops. On October 31st, 1993, two years after the Rodney King beating, Tupac was in Atlanta riding in a car with his boys and saw two white dudes assaulting a black man. At the time, Tupac was already an up-and-coming actor and rap star, with a lot to lose. Yet he chose to intervene and stop the assault. The two white dudes beating the crap out of the innocent black man turned out to be off-duty cops. When Tupac tried to intervene, they pulled out their weapons on Tupac and his friends and fired shots. Tupac went back to his car, retrieved his gun, crouched on one knee, and fired multiple rounds, hitting both police officers, one in the thigh and one in the a**. However, these off-duty cops were confirmed to be active racists, and they had stolen guns from the police evidence room when they were off-duty. This is a weapon which you had no right to have. This is in a county narcotics a weapon he sees that was supposed to be in the property room. So that's a weapon that I see from a case that had been disposed. And not only that, they were found to be intoxicated at the time of the incident. So as a result, Tupac was able to beat the court case, and all charges against him were dismissed. And when the Republicans figured out that a young rap star got away with shooting two off-duty cops, they went bananas. After achieving success as a rap artist and an actor, Tupac never forgot his humble roots and shared the fruits of his success. But most importantly, Tupac was mobilizing his resources for a much more ambitious political project. Right now, I'm into um, mastering the art of war, the art of war. I just found all these new books. Um, um, Thoughts of a general, uh, how to win an argument every time, the buying of a president, um, uh, what's that book I got? The, the Russian guy? Stalin. Stalin, I got that. See, up until his death, Tupac had been working on a movement called Thug Life. And this highly ambitious political project, along with his past dealings with the law and his family history, got the FBI all over him. But what actually was Tupac's Thug Life project? What did it all mean? With the help of his stepfather Matulu Shakur, who originally came up with the idea while in prison, Tupac started a movement known as Thug Life. He helped us form the whole concept. His part was to create the thug code. Tupac is very famous for the Thug Life slogan and tattoo, but most people don't really know what it means. Thug Life is not just a meme or catchphrase. For Tupac, Thug Life represented a political movement. To me, it's like when I say I live the thug life, baby, I'm hopeless. One person might hear that and just like the way it sounds, you know what I'm saying? But I'm doing it for the kid that really lives a thug life and feels like it's hopeless. So when I say hopeless, and when I say the thing, when I say it like that, it's like I reach him. With it, he aimed to facilitate truces between rival gangs, including the Bloods and Crips. The plan was to get them to stop killing each other and to protect black communities against the police by building sources of independent black power, kind of like the Black Panther Party did, and to eventually fight the government if need be. Tupac was trying to radicalize what Karl Marx famously called the lumpen proletariat, which typically wasn't seen as a revolutionary agent for political change. Now around the time that word got out about Tupac's thug life project with his stepfather Matulu, Tupac's life would turn to shit real fast. From here, Tupac started getting arrested and targeted by the police a lot more. But due to the media portrayals, most people only remember Tupac getting arrested, not being acquitted. So as a result, Tupac was branded as a gangster who was just out of control. 
As my video was debuting on MTV, I was behind bars getting beat up by the police department. I got a $10 million lawsuit. They, they said they were settled with me and everything. You know what I'm saying? But nobody cared about that. That wasn't blew up all in the news. In they Oakland. didn't see me. They did not see me on TV with my eye busted, my head busted. There's pictures of those. In Oakland, you don't, you're talking. Yes, in Oakland. You don't see them pictures. You see pictures of Tupac coming out of jail in cuffs. You don't see pictures of the police standing over me beating my brains in. You don't see that. But I see that. I had no record all my life. Okay? No record, no police record, until I made a record. Now, Tupac's radical family background, his early political activity, his past dealings with the cops, and his thug life project all culminated in the FBI essentially waging a war on Tupac, which John Potash talks about in great depth in his book titled The FBI's War on Tupac. Now, there are a lot of details in this book which we simply don't have time to go over, but here are some facts which you should know about the FBI's involvement with Tupac. There were these two criminals who tried to extort Tupac, Haitian Jack and James Henchman Rosemond. Both these men turned out to be working for the FBI since the late 80s up until the late 90s. I ended up staying out of trouble from 1990 to 2004, 14 year run. Haitian Jack, the undercover FBI agent, introduced Tupac to a woman, the same woman who would accuse Tupac of rape and sexual assault, charges in which Tupac was eventually found to be not guilty of. In 1994, Tupac got shot by the orders of James Rosemond, but fortunately Tupac would survive. Still, despite the accusations being baseless, Tupac ended up having to go to prison for sexual assault but was found innocent of rape. He was released after 11 months when new evidence was found helping prove his innocence, evidence which the prosecutors were said to possess. Tupac refused to remain silent about Jimmy Henchman and Haitian Jack, and he openly accused them of being FBI informants, and he publicly attacked other rappers who were associated with them namely Biggie Smalls and his business associate P. Diddy. Now between the FBI, political parties, police officers, and gangbangers, Tupac had accumulated a lot of enemies and became increasingly paranoid. I th I, he didn't think he was gonna make it. I mean, a lot of youth at that time as well felt the same way that we didn't feel we was gonna make it to 21, 23, we didn't, you know? He didn't think he was gonna make it to 21. Tupac Shakur had always anticipated that he was going to die young, but he didn't want to. He wanted to be around for a long time, so that he could change the world, or at the very least spark others to change the world. But Tupac had gained far too many enemies, not to mention that Tupac's life became a lot more dangerous due to being signed by Death Row Records, who was controlled by Suge Knight, who had many gang ties, committed many crimes, and had many targets on his back. With more and more enemies surrounding him, Tupac's paranoia proved to be warranted, as he would soon be murdered at just the age of 25. Every brother in here, please take your hat off. At 7.03 p.m. New York time, 4.03 p.m. Las Vegas time, Tupac Shakur passed away, y'all. Trouble-plagued rapper and actor Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur. Rap star Tupac Shakur died last night after a brief life in a rough business. He was 25. After Tupac's murder, Death Row Records would heavily take advantage of Tupac's widely publicized death by profiting heavily from his image and his unfinished work. They took many of Tupac's unpublished recordings and just slapped them onto instrumentals and mashed them all together to put out a bunch of posthumous albums that Tupac himself never consented to releasing. Some of these songs were good, and many of them were quite subpar compared to what Tupac had put out himself. And many of Tupac's real fans were unhappy with how Death Row took advantage of his death by profiting from his legacy. In his book titled The Society of the Spectacle, the French Marxist theorist Guy Debord wrote about a phenomenon that he called recuperation, a process whereby subversive acts and ideas that oppose the status quo become co-opted, incorporated, and commodified by capitalist media, thereby neutralizing them and diffusing them of their radical substance, allowing these political acts and ideas to become common empty signifiers that no longer threaten the system, which are then sold back to the masses by that very system. If the government were to ban or censor Tupac's music, or persecute him directly, they would only further reignite Tupac's cause, and it would signal to the whole world that what he was doing was in fact a threat to the status quo. Tupac became a signifier without a signified, a simulacrum, an image completely detached from its original content. Tupac was quite literally turned into a hologram. But to reclaim Tupac's radical left-wing vision, we have to historicize. And this is a process that we should seek to do with all famous figures who have been co-opted, like Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Frederick Douglass, and many more. This video and all of One Dime videos are supported by my patrons on Patreon. This channel is completely fan-funded, 
And without your support, small independent leftist content like this simply can't compete with large media conglomerates. If you've been a fan of the channel for a while and appreciate these videos, becoming a patron would help this channel tremendously. Thank you very much to the patrons for supporting me thus far. I would like to end the video by listing what I think are some of Tupac's most radical songs. Words of Wisdom, Trapped, Violent, Changes, and Keep Your Head Up. That one's a classic. Like and comment if you enjoyed, and see you in the next video.